Okay, I'm gonna admit all. Gonna give it like two minutes in case. What the fuck? Oh my gosh, it's so cool to see all these people. Okay. Hi everyone, we will get started very shortly. There's a few people that are in the waiting room that I'm admitting. So we'll give it about another minute. Um, but as you guys are getting settled in, please make sure to mute your microphone unless you're asking or answering a question. Um, and then if you have any questions, please send them in the chat. Uh, we will be answering them or addressing them uh, during the Q&A portion of this presentation. Okay. There's Jane. Hey, look at that. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started since we are at 12.01. Welcome. Today is Wednesday, November 10th. We are in the middle of Global Entrepreneurship Week, if you happen to know that. Um, and today our presentation is on intellectual property as a civil rights issue. I'm extremely excited. Um, my name is Hadiza Saadu. I Let's see. All righty, so it looks like Hadiza, let's see. Just left the room. Can some, can you, uh, just by a nod of heads, can you all hear me? Okay, could you hear Hadiza or did she get cut off? She got cut off. Okay, all righty. Well, you know what? The shows, this is, you know, no business like show business, we're gonna keep going. So Hadiza was beginning to introduce herself uh, and she's already gone through the presentation reminders, which I'll just reiterate. So if you all could please mute your microphone unless you are asking or answering a question towards the end of the session, we will have a Q and A. Um, but I'm really excited about this talk and I really do want it to be as you know engaging and as interactive as possible. So during the time that I'm talking, if there's anything that you know really sparks your interest or if there's any type of questions that you have, go ahead and put them into the chat. And then at the end of this presentation, Hadiza and I will facilitate a Q&A. And probably the most important disclaimer I'm going to give is that although I am an attorney, I am not your attorney. The, you know, the conversations that we're having here and the opinions that I'm giving do not constitute legal advice. So please be mindful of that. Apologies for that. I am not sure what just happened. I was just kicked off of Zoom. Oh, that's all right. I'm very went... glad that it was still recording. I don't know what happened there. Um, I went through the main talking points and you can just pick back up right here. Absolutely. Okay. Now, let me get this out because I am about to read you all Cynthia's bio and explain to you all why an attorney based in Chicago 
is presenting content to an audience in Kansas City. Um, so Cynthia and I actually met through a mutual friend about six months ago, and we got to talking about what we do. And she mentioned, and this is the verbatim phrase that she used um, in talking about her work as an attorney. Cynthia said to me, I view intellectual property as a modern civil rights. I think that we lost Hadiza again. Uh, I don't see anyone's camera on. So I'm going to no Hadiza, right? I do see my mother. So we're gonna pick back up. So as Hadiza was starting to say, I consider intellectual property to be a modern civil rights issue. And that's really going to frame the entire discussion that we're giving here. Um, if you the event, you probably did already. Did already. Before I get into my bio, here's the presentation structure and it's our agenda for this afternoon. First, I'll start with a brief history on the theft of black intellectual property and why that matters. Next, I'll define exactly what intellectual property is. After that, I'll give an overview of the four to five major types of intellectual property, both the laws and protections. And then I'll share some pretty cool things that a lot of artists are doing in order to leverage the power of their intellectual property. And I'll share how you could do the same. And at the tail end of this discussion, we will have a Q&A session. Uh, just a little bit about me. Again, my name is Cynthia Assam. I'm the founder and principal attorney of Assam Law and Consulting. We are a law firm that specializes in assisting creatives, entrepreneurs, um, and small businesses with their business, entertainment, and intellectual property law needs. I am proudly one of the less than 2% of U.S. licensed intellectual property attorneys who are Black, and I absolutely consider equity in intellectual property a modern civil rights issue. Um, I actually have a background in civil rights. My legal career started at the Minneapolis Department of Civil Rights, and it's definitely those experiences, although I've transcended now and I'm in intellectual property, it is that background in civil rights that contributes to the lens that I view all of IP and really a lot of the things that I'm gonna to talk to you about here. Okay, so our conversation is going to begin with a brief history on the theft of black intellectual property. Like many racial disparities in the United States of America, the theft of intellectual property has its gruesome roots in, in slavery. So on the left here, we have a painting of Dred Scott and the theft of black IP really does begin with the Dred Scott case. So in 1857, the United States Supreme Court truthfully stunned the nation and their decision to not only uphold slavery, but to continue to deny the legality of black citizenship in America. So what this means is that because slaves were not considered American citizens, under then current laws, slaves couldn't hold property, intellectual property, also including patents. And later on that year, the then US commissioner of patents doubled down on that decision by stating that slave inventions could not be patented. So why does this matter? Especially when we're thinking about the agricultural revolution of the 18th and 19th century in the United States of America, our economy boomed. And a lot of that growth and economic growth really came from inventions that were created by slaves. One such invention is the cotton scraper. On the left here, I have an image of the illustration for a patent of the improved cotton scraper. So it's not the original cotton scraper that was created by a slave, but this inventor here, James Joseph Hobbs, is a white male, or rest in peace, was a white male from Texas. As I was doing research for this, one quote that I found that was very interesting from a slaveholder who was trying to apply for a patent that is made, he stated that, quote, the master is the owner of the fruits of the labor of the slave, both manual and intellectual, meaning slaves and we don't just own the agriculture and the crops that they create, we also own their intellectual property. So again, 
The theft of Black intellectual property has its roots in slavery, but it also continues today. And so here I've taken a few different headlines from major news sources such as NPR, NBC, um, and also uh, a screenshot from the Jimmy Fallon show. So in the agricultural revolution, we saw that Black creators uh, of different tools were getting, uh, didn't get credit for the patents that they were creating. And today in this digital revolution and in this digital era, we see this very similar trend. We see young black dancers and artists and creative cre creatives creating different types of dances that completely go viral. But when it comes to the credit for it, the black creators are not given that credit. And why does that matter? It's truthfully not just about fame and it's not just about recognition. Here in these good United States of America, the dollar is king. So it really also is about compensation. Here I have an image of racial wealth inequity in the United States of America. Um, this blue line right here represents the average of white wealth. And then the two bottom lines, which are orange and red, represent Black and Latino wealth. There are a host of issues that contribute to these racial divides in wealth and equity in the United States of America but one that cannot be left out as an important factor is um, you know, the theft of black IP. So before we continue, I think it's important that we actually all are on the same page. So what is intellectual property? Intellectual property generally is a product of the human mind. And the aim of intellectual property law is to encourage new creations, new creations like art, software, and medical devices that one, benefit society at large, and two, increase economic growth. So in exchange for these new creations, laws grant certain rights to the creators. Now these rights afford creators the exclusive rights to use, to sell, monetize their creations, and also protect these creations from theft by them. And today, intellectual property is perhaps the most preeminent business asset. And to put things into perspective, um, IP is big business, you all. IP is big money. So in 2016, the US Commerce Department released a comprehensive report indicating that IP is used in virtually every single segment of the US economy. However, the US economy does have these specific, quote, IP intensive industries. And in those IP intensive industries, they those specific IP intensive industries are the source of over 30% of all jobs in the country. IP is big business. All right, so now we're gonna get into the different types of intellectual property and the different types of protections that you could have with intellectual property. We have trade secrets, patents, copyrights, trademarks, and contracts. So a lot of different situations will call for a combination of trademarks. And one thing that, especially for the artists and the entrepreneurs who are uh, in the audience here, I want you to continue to think about yourself, not only as an artist, but also as a business and also as a brand. So multiple different types of intellectual property protections can also mean multiple streams of revenue. So the first type of IP protection that we have is a trade secret. I don't practice trade secret. Oh, well, actually, let me talk a little bit about trade secrets and talk about why I don't do it. So I'm not gonna read this out to you, but I will give you a few examples of what trade secrets are. When we think about the secret spice blend for KFC, or even what exactly is in Coca-Cola, what exactly that um, recipe is, those are some examples of trade secrets. Things for all of you to keep in mind though, especially if you have anyone in there who is a chef or who has a company where they will be creating like spice blends or anything, it's really important if you want to maintain the trade secret um, protections, you have to actually keep it a secret. There's a reason why none of us know exactly what is in Big Mac sauce, even though we try to recreate it. There's a reason why we don't know exactly what those 25 spices are in the KFC blend. Another type of intellectual property are patents. So also at my firm, I do not practice patent law, um, but patents actually are really interesting. And a patent is an exclusive right granted for an invention uh, for which is a product or process that provides a new way of doing something or it offers a technical solution to a, a problem. There's three different categories of patents. You've got your utility, design, and plat plant patents. 
What's interesting about patent protection, it means that if you invent something and you get it patented, that same invention cannot be made, used, distributed, or sold by others without your consent. Patents are normally valid for about 20 years, and there are five primary requirements. It's gotta be patentable subject matter. It's, uh, there's also the utility requirement, the novelty requirement, the non-obviousness requirement, and enablement. And so on the left here, I've got a picture of the iPhone. Although the iPhone is not the first cell phone that was ever existed, um, the way that the iPhone was designed and as illustrated by the patent that they applied for, it was a completely new way of utilizing a cell phone, both in terms of design and also in terms of um, internal hardware and processing. Moving right along, next we have copyrights. So I think like as, as we're moving along here, I'm getting more excited about the different types of IP protections. So copyrights, that is something that my law firm does. And copyrights um, are obtained, copyrights are a form of federal protection. And there's eight broad categories of original works that are eligible for copyright. So especially for you writers and for you musicians, anybody who's written a musical that you're sitting on, copyright your work and put it out there to the world. So I won't read it off to you, but you do see here that we have eight broad categories of original works that are eligible for copyright. In addition to the copyright falling into one of those categories, the copyright, uh, whatever it is that you're trying to get copyrighted, it must also be original. Like I can't state that enough. It must be original. You can't copyright someone else's work. Um, it must be, and it, and it also can't be a fact or an abstract idea. There, although from the moment that you create, you know, your literary or musical piece of art, you do have inherent copyright protections, there is a, it's really important that you actually take the next step and go to the US Copyright Office virtually and actually register your copyright. And again, when we're thinking about monetizing your IP, there are six exclusive rights that you can only get if your, cop, if your work of art is actually copyrighted. So you have the opportunity to publish or reproduce your work. You can make derivative works, which you can also monetize. You can distribute copies. You can perform the work. You can display the work. Um, the term of a copyright typically lasts 70 years. And this is something that not a lot of folks understand. Yes, from the moment that you create something, you do have like common law copyrights, but if someone is um, infringing on your copyrights, in order to have standing to bring a suit, the copyright has to have been filed and it has to have been registered. So in addition to being able to monetize your creative copyrighted work, you also could sue somebody if they're stealing your work. And on top of being able to sue them, you also may be awarded statutory damages and also attorney's fees for even having to sue them in the first place. Um, there can be a little bit of confusion about the differences between copyrights and also trademarks. So I have a few examples of some things that you can copyright. You can copyright books, photographs, painting, software, and also website content. Now, one of my favorite uh, types of intellectual property is trademarks. So what exactly is a trademark? A trademark is any word, any name, symbol, design, or combination thereof that is used in commerce to both identify and distinguish the goods of one manufacturer for an from another, and also to indicate the source of the goods. So typically we see that words, phrases, logos, and symbols are all used by producers to identify their goods. But what's really interesting is one of the trends in IP that we're starting to see is that you can also trademark shapes. You can trademark sounds fragrances, and also colors. Um, trade dress is also a subcategory of trademarks. So if there are any designers who are uh, either taking a look or watching this live or the rebroadcast, you can also trademark the designs of your clothing. Now, why is it that I like trademarks? Well, the barrier to entry for an entrepreneur or for a small business owner is pretty low, especially when you compare the pricing of how much it is to patent something. And there are a lot of uh, advantages of federally registering your trademark. So first of all, especially if you're a small business and especially if you feel as though you're providing a good, a product or a service that, you, uh, that a lot of competitors provide something similar, 
a trademark is one of the best ways to start not only building your brand identity, but also differentiating what you do and the special way that you do it from any other competitor who might be doing something similar. So it's a powerful tool for building your brand identity. A lot of times folks, you might see a word or a slogan and you see a TM behind it. That typically means that the trademark is pending. But you know, I think it's super exciting when folks finally get that letter from the USPTO that they can now start using their brand name, their slogan or their logo with that very powerful R in the middle of a circle. Another important um, advantage of having a trademark is that you have nationwide protection, meaning your brand, you know, uh, your brand is good on every block, on every corner in the United States. And similar to copyrights, you have to actually file for a trademark in order to sue in federal court and also get damages for infringement. Now, although I said there is a lower barrier of entry to for this form of intellectual property compared to the other ones. I do get that there is a pretty penny that is associated with it. So a lot of folks don't know what or when the best time to file for a trademark is. And like I tell all of my clients, but this is not legal advice again, y'all, this is just general advice. The best strategy that you could have for your brand is to think about trademarks from the very beginning. Honestly, from the moment that you're even thinking about your business name, your logo, and your business entity, you wouldn't want to build your house up on a shaky foundation and your trademarks and also being able to clear your trademarks are that foundation. A, a point of advice that I also give too is setting aside an intellectual property or even more generally a legal budget for all of your business needs in the same way that you're putting together, putting together a budget for operations, photography, marketing, and other types of costs. You know, it's just as important. And um, may I say, I think it's the most important thing. I understand I'm a lawyer. Okay, so again, I love trademarks. I think that trademarks are very exciting. What can you trademark and how can you trademark um, your, your, your slogan or your phrase? So here I have a chart that's from the New Jersey Institute of Technology, and it does a really good job at laying out how it is that you could get something um, trademark versus what is most likely going to get your application rejected. So if it's not distinctive, if it doesn't stand out, if it's just a common name or even a noun, you are most likely not going to get that trademark application approved. But you know there is a spectrum to it. So the more distinctive that your word, your mark, your slogan, um, your brand is, the more likely you are to have that trademark be approved. So we have on the left, you're not going to get a trademark for something like soap or phone, but um, you will get a trade. Well, Exxon got a trademark. You won't get a trademark for Exxon because they already have it. But if you came up with something fanciful or made up, you also could obtain a trademark barring any other um, disqualifiers. Probably the most well-known and the most popular trademark that all of us know is Nike. So again, a trademark can be a word, which is Nike, but it can also be a symbol, which is the swoosh, and it can also be the slogan, just do it. Again, as we're thinking about one type of intellectual property, but three ways to monetize it, Nike can put on t-shirts, just their brand name, just their brand slogan, and just their brand logo. And it's the same company, but three different types of IP, three different ways to monetize it. So now that we've talked a little bit about, you know, the history of the theft of Black intellectual property, and then, you know, we set the foundation of what exactly intellectual property is, I want to share with you all some of the really cool ways that artists are learning the value of their intellectual property and really leveraging it to not only, you know, increase their brands, but also increase the amount of money that they have. So, you know, I'm a Rihanna fan. I like what she does. I like how she does it. Rihanna is a woman who is an actress, of course. She is a singer. She's Grammy Award winning, if not winning, nominated. Um, there are a few households that you could go to in this globe where they don't know who Rihanna is. Despite that popularity and that type of commercial success that Rihanna has had as a singer, performer, and actress, it was in the recent years that Rihanna's status really blew up and Forbes magazine noted that she now is a billionaire. This is one of the ways that, the, excuse me, that Rihanna was able to transcend her status as just a singer and multi-hyphenate artist to become a businesswoman. 
So I have here, and this is um, from the United States uh, Patent and Trademark Office, Rihanna's holding company actively has 56 different trademarks either registered or in the process of being registered. And you can take a look at some of them here to get an idea, not only of what, Be excuse me, I keep wanting to say Beyonce because I love her, uh, but you get an idea not only of what Rihanna has done in the past in order to build up her brand and increase revenue, but it also gives you an idea of some of the businesses that she may have in the future. When I see each of these trademarks, I'm thinking not only of businesses, but multiple, multiple ways that she can monetize each of these distinct brands. All right, this is why I kept wanting to say Beyonce, because I love Beyonce and I will talk about her at every opportunity that I get, but it's actually really fitting and really appropriate here. So once again, artists are learning the value of their intellectual property. And what I'd like to do is have just a brief case study utilizing Beyonce's documentary film, Homecoming which was the footage of her, I think it was 2018 or 2019 Coachella performance. I was there, thank you. So we are going to play a brief game of would you rather. So would you rather have 8 million US dollars for your performance guaranteed, or would you rather have 4 million US dollars? However, you also have the right to both record and sell your footage as you see fit. I, let me see, I'm looking in the chat room. I cannot see the chat room, but you know what? Okay, I'll, uh, Amelia said for the Rihanna, oh, she asked a question, what does it mean to file under the same name multiple times, which I was gonna ask, but then yeah. Jade said that they would take 8 million and run. Almarie said that they would take 4 million and the rights oh. to record and sell your footage. All right, so it's 50-50. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Amarie. Oh, wait, another person said, Bessie, or I don't know how to pronounce your name. I'm, I apologize. Four million in rights. Ryan Lee also says four all day. Kaya or Kia, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Four million, please. Amelia said four million. Four million. All right, okay. Well, you know what? You guys, I'm glad you guys were here. You guys are absolutely <laughs> on the right page. So... Yes, that's also what I would do. I would take that 4 million, but then also get those rights to record the footage of my performance, which is likely what Beyonce did. So to give a little bit of context, I, I do remember when Coachella was happening and it came out that allegedly Ariana Grande was paid $8 million to headline Coachella compared to Beyonce getting paid $4 million. I felt like there had to be some reason for that, especially considering the popularity of both of the artists and then also their commercial success. So it came out later on that um, Beyonce, so this is, all, this is all my hypothesis, but Beyonce likely threw a savvy intellectual property attorney, sold the exclusive license rights of her Coachella footage to Netflix, for a historic $20 million deal. So for those of you who said you would take the 4 million and run, you did the right thing because you took 4 million and you flipped it into 24 million compared to only getting $8 million. And what is so awesome and interesting to me about this is it's one performance that she did, right? On one night, but it's chock filled with valuable IP, which means that she was able to turn it into multiple streams of revenue. So as we are kind of winding down a little bit, I just want to, you know, make sure I let you all know, despite all the information that I've given you, what is it that you could do from here in order to protect yourself, protect your brand and to protect your IP. So uh, Hadiza is going to get into the first things that you all can do, which is utilizing cost effective resources. Hadiza, do you want to take it? I'm still muted. Yes. And I really hope Zoom doesn't kick me off again. I am. I apologize, y'all. That has never happened before. And I'm on library Wi-Fi, so it really is very mind boggling why that happened. But um, Cynthia, Cynthia spent a lot of time talking about intellectual. Well, obviously, this is about intellectual, intellectual property, but trademarking. Uh, so if you are on this, watching this live or watching this uh, during playback, and you've been thinking in your mind, maybe I should set up a business around my creative endeavors, um, there is a tool, 
available through the public library with your library card if you want to access it remotely uh, that helps you decide what kind of entity to set up for any kind of business for profit or nonprofit. Um, and it also takes you step by step through what you need to do to get your business officially registered. So it doesn't take the place of legal advice. So again, do not take it as any legal advice. Um, it's a tool that helps you before you go to a lawyer, refine any questions that you might have, or just kind of uncover the unknown unknowns that you have within the legal environment of getting um, set up as a business. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, Cynthia, can you see my screen? Yes. Awesome, so you are seeing the Kansas City Public Library website. Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Somebody wrote in the chat. We will, Amelia, we're gonna to get to your questions very shortly. Um, okay, so Cynthia has been talking um, primarily about how you as an individual artist creative can protect your own intellectual property uh, through trademarking. Um, I'm gonna show you a little bit of the other side of that as far as what you need to do to make sure you're not infringing on somebody else's trademark. Uh, and Legal GPS does a very good job of illustrating that. So as I'm getting this pulled up, um, some background on Legal GPS. One, it makes my job easier because when people have legal questions, I can walk through Legal GPS with them and it's all in one place. Um, but two, this was actually a tool that uh, we did, uh, we got onto our catalog um, after a series of months um, of lengthy collaboration with uh, attorney and founder of Legal GPS, Chris Deming, who is located in St. Louis. So it wasn't something that we just saw and thought, oh, this could be useful, let's get it. We worked very closely with the founders and their development team to make sure that this would be a, um, something that works um, not only for me working with patrons, but for uh, individual patrons who are working uh, with it on their own. So uh, if you're interested in using Legal GPS, uh, you can set up an appointment with me. Uh, we can go through it together. Or uh, if you already have a Kansas City Public Library card, you can access this at home. Um, by going to our website, kclibrary.org, going to resources slash research, going to L and then scrolling to the legal GPS entry where you will click access legal GPS. And since you wouldn't have already been registered, you will create a separate account using your email address. Since I'm already registered, I'm gonna just sign in. I'm gonna briefly walk you through like the high broad strokes level of how to use this. There is a lot of information within Legal GPS, and there is no way that I can cover it uh, within the time that we have allotted. So if if Zoom will allow me to click in, I will hold on just a second. Oh, there we go. I'm gonna reset the dashboard. That way you see how this works from level one. So there are three levels. The goal is to finish all three levels. So as you start with each level, you're going to be taken through a series of questions. Level one assumes that you have not formed a business entity and that you don't know what kind of entity you want to form. Um, since we are talking in the creative realm, it's very likely that you're going to be wanting to form a for-profit business, but you may be wanting to form an arts-based nonprofit. Um, those are the different options that you have as far as if you have not decided yet what kind of entity to form. Basically, the options that you have are LLC, corporation, and nonprofit. And um, depending on which one you choose, level two will take you through the steps in order uh, that they need to occur to get your business officially registered. Um, so we're just gonna say, no, we have not formed an entity. Um, the other great thing about Legal GPS um, is as you might be able to notice, uh, there are links embedded um, within the question. So if you do not know what an entity is, you can click here on entity and get more information about what an entity actually means in the legal 
uh, context, there are two types of entities, a tax entity and a state law entity. We will not get into that right now. Um, and then if you want to know the differences between an LLC corporation and nonprofit, you can click on those links as well. If you're still stumped on how to answer the question, you can click here for more information um, and hopefully that will clear it up by then. Uh, so we'll confirm you have not formed an entity. So Legal GPS is now going to ask a series of questions to help nar narrow down the choices. So we either want to form a nonprofit or, or a for-profit business. So we're going to say for-profit. And then do you know yet if you absolutely want or need to set up a formal entity? Because sometimes you can operate as a disregarded entity. Um, other times it makes more sense to operate as an established entity like an LLC or corporation. I'm just going to say right now, yes, I definitely want to set up an LLC or corporation because I've got a little bit more knowledge with that. Okay. Now it's asking me, how am I going to operate? Is it more like a small business or a startup? And just to keep it simple, they say majority of people at this point are going to select a small business. So what I like to clarify here is that a, the difference between a small business and a startup is to think about the growth potential. If you're a small business, we're thinking about growth that's a lot more um, linear. Um, or maybe it's constant, or maybe there's not that much growth. Um, but we're thinking of mom and pop type um, shop businesses. A startup, starkly, is much starkly different in that you can think of it as an Amazon type of situation where it started in somebody's garage and now has taken over the entire world. So 98% of companies are going to select small business. Now, if you decide that you want to be the only owner um, or multiple or if you want to have multiple owners, this is where you're going to decide that. So I'm going to say I'm a small business with one owner. But if you're not sure, you can also click on E. But for the purpose of a demonstration, we're pretty sure about what we're doing. All right, confirm. And now we have finished level one. So after we've finished level one, we are going to calibrate the GPS. And then we're going to view results. So this first section of our results after level one is really just giving us instructions on how to use legal GPS. If this is a tool that you want to use, make sure to read through everything thoroughly. I will not be reading this to you today, um, but the goal is to finish all three levels. This is definitely a time commitment up front, but the way you want to think about this is um, in addition to what Cynthia was saying about um, establishing a budget for legal, you want to also think about the time that is required to really gather your bearings, because a lot of people don't have any knowledge um, when it comes to getting their business established. And even people that have had experience uh, setting up an LLC in the past may still have some misconceptions about how to set up um, an LLC in the future. Uh, so the, again, the goal is to finish all three levels. Once you finish all three levels, you will get um, basically uh, something that will help you think about the things that are important uh, to think about as you continue to operate. Um, there will also be a vault that is unlocked after you complete the third level, um, which is where you will get uh, that additional information. Um, but once You've also finished, you're going to get a report that shows you how you moved through legal GPS. Um, and then you also get a scorecard that gives you an estimate of the time and money that you've saved. Um, and as far as money, this is money saved um, where you wouldn't be asking more um, entry level questions to an attorney. Um, you are coming to an attorney with more informed questions because you've already gone through legal GPS. So that amount of time that you would have spent up front um and money that you would have spent up front is eliminated because you have already addressed those unknown unknowns through legal gps and now you're going to an attorney for more specialized questions okay so that is the breakdown of how legal gps works you're going to want to read each section as you go through the results and once you finish each, each section you will go back over to the left hand side and check off that you've read that and it will track your progress so now, after we've gone through the instructions, um, this is a very important section to read. Um, 
a lot of people know that legal is important to think about because they don't they know that they could potentially end up in trouble um but they don't know exactly why so one example that i really love to share whenever i'm working uh, with individuals one-on-one -on -one or giving a presentation is this first example of why legal is important and this is really touching on trademarking so what i have found in working with people one-on-one -on -one is most people if they have some working knowledge of how to set up an entity they know that they need to um, make sure that the name that they have in mind for their business is not already taken um, within the state that they're looking to um, uh, found their organization in um, what a lot of people don't know or neglect to do is to make sure that the, thing, that the name that they select for their business not only is not selected in the state within which they're trying to register, but is not already trademarked. So this is the first example. Uh, in 2016, there was a women and minority focused incubator that started its operations. Um, and it was operating under a specific name. The next year, there was a funding company that was based in a different state that had the same name as this incubator that was able to bring a federal lawsuit against the incubator for using the name. So what ended up happening was the women and minority focused incubator incurred substantial costs because of the lawsuit and they lost the right to use the name. And because they lost the right to use the name, they had to face consequences from a marketing standpoint, meaning they lost substantial goodwill and had to completely rebrand. So if we're thinking about an incubator that is focused on um, promoting women and minorities, they lost a lot of ground because they neglected to do a trademark search for the business name that they registered. There are other examples that you can read on your own, and there's also videos embedded within Legal GPS. So there's all types of ways you can learn about getting set up um, as an official business through Legal GPS. So um, that's just background on why legal is important. One of the most uh, common things that business owners neglect, uh, which is the trademark search, um, which is why it's the first example. Um, so then. After we read through that, we're, we've checked off that we've read that, and then this version of level one, because sometimes it doesn't have this much detail. Um, this is really covering um, how you go about the process of choosing the right entity. And the how, the how to go about that requires that you understand what types of entities there are and when you would select one over another. Um, so it's covering the differences between state law and tax law entity before getting acquainted with legal GPS, I did not know that there was a tax law entity. So I have learned quite a bit over the time working with legal GPS and working with individuals. Um, a lot more um, information about the specific steps that you take, but not necessarily in order. Um, so your state law entity effectively will determine how you will operate. And when you do that, what you're doing is you are filing a document called the Articles of Organization, if you're an LLC, or the Articles of Incorporation, if you're a corporation. And if it was the nonprofit version, it would be, I think it's Articles of Organization again. I may be wrong. Don't quote me. So. The tax law entity is different from the state law entity in that it is the entity that determines how you will be taxed. So there are four versions of a tax law entity. There's the disregarded entity. So technically three, but, but we will say disregarded entity is one version. A partnership, a C corporation, and an S corporation. And again, you can click on these links here to know exactly what is meant by disregarded entity in the context of a tax law. Okay, so after you have understood the basics of what uh, an entity is, state law or tax law, um, then that's when you're going to take the time to determine what combination of state and tax law entity you're going to register for your business. Um, I'm not going to read through all of this. Let me see, I have to move this. Um, there are a lot. Again, there's a lot of embedded information within Legal GPS that helps you make the right choice. And if you're still stumped, 
at the very least, you can take this information and speak to a lawyer. Okay, but I would still recommend speaking to a lawyer if, if things are more complicated. Um, you can learn more here. Again, I'm not gonna read all of this, but there's just a lot for you to go through. Um, and comparing t tax law entities for single owner small businesses. It's giving um, various combinations that you can um, create if you are a single owner small business. It's, that's what we said we wanted to be. You could be an LLC as the state law plus tax law entity disregarded entity, or you could be an LLC that's combined with an S corporation um, tax law entity. Um, okay, a lot to read. Again, not going to read it all. Now we're going to head over to level two because I want to show you what I believe is the most powerful part of Legal GPS because, and I can say this from my own experience, before we had Legal GPS, when people came to the library with questions about the steps you need to take to get an LLC or a corporation registered. I had to piecemeal find this information through various corners of the internet. And of course, with the caveat saying I'm not a lawyer, here are some legal resources that we have we know of, but I'm not a lawyer. This is the best that I can do. Um, granted, these are all pieces of information taken from different states. So let's keep that in mind. So that was not the best approach, clearly. Um, so again, like I've said before, Legal GPS has made my job easier <laughs> selfishly. But countless people that I've worked with, every time I show them this, because there is not a tool like this that's just freely available, have said how, how helpful Legal GPS has been as far as gaining a very solid understanding before they take these important steps. So as we go through level two, this is where we are. If we have not yet already, we are deciding what kind of entity we're going to form. So in level one, the main objective objective was to for, was to determine which state and tax entity would be best for our business in level two uh legal gps is going to help us form that entity so what kind of state entity do entity do we want to form i'm going to say llc because i i kind of had an idea that i wanted to do that but level one confirmed that if you still don't know then you need to go back to level one and change some of your answers because uh that uh, legal GPS will respond to those changes. Okay, so I'm going to say there's only going to be one member, again, just for the purposes of demonstration. And if I don't know what a member is, I can click here and learn more. How will my LLC be taxed with the IRS? Hmm. I'm just going to go with whatever the default is, and that is disregarded entity. I don't really know what that means, but I'm just going to go with that for now. So, Yay, we have finished level two. If I want to change my answers, I can go back. Um, but right now I'm going to calibrate. View results. So similar to level one, we are reading off these uh, text heavy sec sections uh, and going through any relevant um, links and then going to the side and checking off that we have read that. So we've read the directions, you will actually read them. And then the way that I like to go through level two, just an abbreviated version, is you can kind of think of this left-hand side as a bit of a checklist of what you need to do and in what order, if I know that I want to form an, a single member LLC. So the first thing that you're gonna do is pick the best state and Legal GPS provides additional information on how to determine which state makes the most sense. A lot of information to read through here and a, and a video to watch. I'm not going to go through that right now. Okay, so after you have determined the best state to form your LLC, that's when you're going to choose a name. So when you choose your name, you're going to do a search, a business entity search, if you're in Missouri, at the Missouri Secretary of State website. And you're going to make sure that it is not already taken within the state that you are looking to register. But then, after you do that, or even at the same time, 
you're going to perform a trademark search. And this is the step that a lot of business owners disregard or don't think is a real step. Um, this is where you're determining whether or not you would be infringing on anybody else's intellectual property by registering your business name as whatever selected business name that has not been selected within your state. This is where you are determining whether or not somebody who has a national trademark, well, wouldn't they all be nat national? I'm not sure, right? They're all national, okay, right. They're just default national. That's what I guessed, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank God Cynthia is here. <laughs> all right, so once you've determined that nobody in the state that you're registering your business has your name, then you need to make sure that you're not infringing nationally on anybody's intellectual property by registering that name. And this take action section, this is one of the longest ones within level two. There's a lot of resources um, that you can click on that will help you um, as far as choosing a name and also determining the likelihood that you would be infringing on somebody else's copyright um, or trademark, excuse me, not, not copyright. Um, there's also, kind of a case study here um, covering Shafley, which is a beer brewing company who was sued by a person named Shafley, Shafley. So a similar name, not quite the same, but they were able to draw a lawsuit. So read that from um, additional information and context. Um, and then there's options that you can take um, to provide, uh, to conduct a trademark search. You could do it yourself. You could hire a company or you could hire an attorney. Um, and then the most important rule is that you can't have a name that a customer could confuse for another brand. Read more about that. Read more about how to perform the search. Um, yeah, I hate skimming through this. I really do. Every time I have to like abbreviate it, I feel like, gosh, there's so much I could like share um just for like your own knowledge to take home but it's like there's so much that if i start i'm going to keep going and we don't have time for that so after you have performed a trademark search i made sure that you're not infringing on anybody else's intellectual property um, you are then going to determine the llc's organizer and registered agent and the organizer is the one who files the LLC's articles of organization. The registered agent is the one who receives all the court filings. Um, more information when you click on both of those. And then some notes to consider that are very important. One thing about, one thing uh, about a registered agent is that you want to make sure that you are selecting um, somebody that has, uh, it's basically reliable, that can um, answer and respond to um, any court communication. All right, so once you have done that, then it will be time for you to determine how your LLC will be managed. Um, so then um, that's basically where you are determining whether it is a manager managed LLC or a single member LLC. And there's more information um, embedded as you continue forward. So. Once you have determined how the LLC will be managed, you then file your articles of organization. And this take action section is basically going to walk you through each of the articles, what each of the articles means, and there's also a template for you to do it yourself. And you don't need to go and find that template elsewhere. Okay. So after you have prepared and filed your articles of organization, then you're going to complete your LLC's operating agreement. Um, and then you'll do this by taking action to learn how to prepare your operating agreement and use one of the templates that Legal GPS has provided based on what kind of membership structure you have. All right. Whew. So that is level one and level two. Um, after you have done um, the operating agreement, that's then when you will get an EIN. Um, and that's essentially Legal GPS in a nutshell, levels one and two. You'll want to do um, levels one and two together for the most part because they go hand in hand. Um, please use this as much uh, as you need to because it's here for you. Um, if you have a Kansas City Public Library card, you can access this from home. Again, 
from our digital catalog, which you can access from our homepage, uh, clicking resources and research and then going into L under uh, the list of resources. Um, additionally, let me go ahead and show you how to schedule a meeting with me in case that's something you want to do. Um, I will include it in the chat and also include it in the follow up. Um, but and see, most of the time people do not find this page because it's not right there. Um, but uh, if you, let me just go back to the very beginning, because I'm sure the reason why I know it is because I use it all the time. You're going to go to resources slash research again, and then in specialized resources, I'm part of a team called Community Reference. And you can go ahead and that's my picture. Go ahead and schedule either a 30 minute or 60 minute Zoom meeting with me. Uh, and there's a list of options uh, for what you want to talk about in our meeting. And so I'll make sure that that link is included in our follow up as well as my email address. I'm going to go ahead and stop that share. Let's go ahead and look at this chat. To, I'm going to go backwards. So Willie, Legal GPS is not a separate seminar. This was just in addition to uh, today's presentation focusing on intellectual property as a modern civil rights issue. Um, and we were sharing additional resources that you can use to empower yourself with information. Um, let's see. Yes, you do have to be a member of KC Public Library to use Legal GPS. If you do not have a KCPL library card, you can come to the li any library branch and use Legal GPS um, on the Wi-Fi with your computer or um, just with any computer here. But if you want to access it from home, you need to have a, a library card. And then um, I know that Amelia had an had a question about uh, Viana's trademarks. And I had the same question. What does it mean to file a trademark under the same name multiple times? So that is a really great question. All right, so the USPTO office, which is the US Patent and Trademark Office, um, trademarks are categorized by the different products and services that they are through a classification known as classes. So there's different categories. So for example, the screen grab that I had up was Rihanna had multiple different Fenty trademark applications that were pending. Um, if you were to click through them though, you would see each of those applications was for a different class or for a different category. So some of those Fenty, some of the trademark applications were for beauty, some were for clothes, some could have been for, let's say, education. But yeah, the when it is that you apply for a trademark, you also are tying that trademark to a specific category known as a class. I believe that makes sense. Uh, I also I can't see the chat. These are were there any more questions? Um, I'm looking. Okay, Amelia had another question about the Beyonce example. If you chop your content into multiple forms, um, e.g., her Netflix special versus her Homecoming album, do you have to file multiple times? Um. So I guess what I'm like, okay, so I understand that to mean if you're going to use the same source of IP in multiple different ways, do you need multiple trademarks or multiple copyrights? I would say it really depends on how you're using it. So let's see. Like, like one thing that I mentioned too, sorry, we're here in the Q&A section. One thing that I mentioned too, you know, there's multiple different ways that you could protect your IP. And I would say if you're working with an IP attorney, you could strategize and kind of stack your IP. So one thing Beyonce did, we're talking about licensing rights. So, you know, selling those exclusive licensing rights to Netflix. Um, but another thing that she did, which was a different form of IP, which didn't require any type of cross registration, um, would also be like the poster art for that performance. So she's got her copyright that's there too. Another way that you can protect your IP is specifically through the IP provisions that are in your contract. So she probably also had an airtight IP provision, both in her agreement with Coachella and also with um, Netflix. Um, but once again, I'm just hypothesizing as that's, prob that's quite likely what she did, but I'm not sure. But especially since she's using multiple different forms of IP 
uh, protections, there wasn't any type of like cross registration or overlap. And then Bessie, I really hope I'm saying your name right. It's Fessa. Fessa, Fessa. Okay, I, I apologize. <laughs> um, should international brands register trademarks in multiple countries? I would say absolutely, yes. Yeah. So one of the things that just, I feel like general advice in life is when you're making moves, you wanna begin with the end in mind. And that's at least how I counsel my clients where is the ultimate level of reach that you want to go with this brand? And let's work our ways to get there. So if you're already foreseeing that you do want to have a brand that has international touch, yes, you should um, register for your trademark and other intellectual property protections in every single country that you want to do business in. Jade had a question. Yes. Oh. Okay. I have just put a link in the chat to Kansas City Volunteer Lawyers and Accountants for the Arts. Um, the executive director, Danielle Merrick, also is the president of the UMKC Legal Clinic, which I don't know how active they are right now. But essentially, Kansas City Volunteer Lawyers and Accountants for the Arts is an organization that focuses on artists. And um, the way that it works is, um, you join as a member, um, and I'm just going to read this here. Um, if you're an artist or arts organization that needs help, what do you do? You download the appropriate application for services that's listed under apply on the website. You're going to follow the instructions and submit them to KCVLAA for a review. All applicants require a non-refundable $25 fee for processing and include eligibility requirements. Um, the fee is waived one time if you are a member or become a member. If you seek assistance from KCVLAA, you will be asked to become a member based on your status as either an individual or organization. Um, and so if you want to get help, the question is, do I have to pay to get help? So if you're seeking assistance from KCVLAA, they're going to ask you to become a member and members pay an annual membership fee. So if you're an individual artist, that fee is $50 for the year. If you're a full-time student, then it's 25. And if you're an organization, the membership price ranges from $50 to $400, depending on your annual budget as an organization. Um, if you do not want to become a member, then there is a one-time non-refundable fee of $25, which helps cover the cost of their professional liability insurance. Um, so basically there are income requirements. Um, and if you do exceed those income guidelines, but not by a lot, they will still help you um, if you become a member, because then they can give you names of volunteers who have indicated that they will accept um, fee generating referrals from them. Okay, so there's a lot in the, in the about section, but if you are looking for assistance, KCVLAA can help. Yeah, so in addition to the like these resources that Hadiza is talking about, of course, Kansas City Public Library is already one very excellent resource where you can get general but still really detailed advice for free. Also KCVLAA that Hadiza just described. But another thing that's interesting when it comes to copyrights, um, the actually the US Copyright Office is really, really helpful. I do do some copyrights, but I far prefer trademarks. But there's a lot of free information that's out there. Another thing that you could do too is um, you can actually copyright your songs. And as long as it's copyrightable, you can actually go online and go onto their website and um, copyright, get file for the copyright yourself. I do see that we're like a little bit yeah. over, but um, it seems to drop off, no problem. But there's one more question from uh, Kia Smith, if I believe my intellectual property has been stolen, is there anything I can do to protect it at this point? Yeah, there is a lot that you can do, which is get in touch with an attorney like fairly quickly um, and just have a consultation with them. So I, I, I let, let's say, for example, you think that it's your logo that's been stolen and somebody else is using it on their website. One, the first thing that I would wanna know if you came up to me was, did you actually trademark it? Do you actually have protections that are in place? And number two, um, is the person using it like in commerce and making it seem like it's their own? But we're about to send a cease and desist. 
Stop it. Stop it right now. But yeah, if you do believe that your intellectual property has been stolen, hopefully you already did have either that copyright or that trademark registration in place. But even if you didn't, just consult an IP attorney and then there are still avenues that we can go through. And before we close out, I would like to thank not only everyone who attended, those who asked questions, thank you all so much. I also wanna give a special thank you to Kansas City Public Library for hosting this event and for having me. And thank you Hadiza too, for trusting me. This is Black Girl Magic, thank you for pitching. This has been awesome. Hadiza shared her information and I do have mine up here. If any of you would like to get in touch with me afterwards, you can um, either reach out to me via email, that's Cynthia at AssamConsulting.com, or you can book a consultation on my website, which is AssamLaw.com. And I can also drop it here. We are. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Oh, Hadiza, this also will be put on the library's YouTube page, right? Yes, yes, this will be. Um, once the playback is ready, we will have that and um, you will all get a link um, so long as you registered, which I'm pretty sure everybody here actually registered, um, you will get a link to the playback. Um, and I didn't actually ask you this initially, Cynthia, are we, can we share this presentation with attendees? Like uh, the PowerPoint or would you rather not? Let's talk about that offline. All right, we'll do that, great. All right, everybody, thank you so much for attending. I apologize for going over time a little bit, um, but hopefully you took something valuable from this and um, please feel free to get in touch with me uh, if you have any questions about your existing business, whether you wanna use legal GPS or you have questions um, about any other aspect of your business. I am here to help. Thank you very much. And that concludes today's presentation on intellectual property as a civil rights issue. Everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.